So this lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra. And what I will be doing today is trying to explain what an affine scheme of a ring is. So informally, this is a way of pretending that R is a ring of functions um, on the spectrum of R. Um, so this is this will be a continuation of the previous lecture. So I'll just very quickly recall what we did there. So the spectrum of R has open sets U of F for F in the ring, which you can think of informally as being the points where f is non-zero. And for each of these open sets, we assigned a ring, O of u of f, which was just r localized at f, which we think of as being functions on the open set u of f. At least it's going to behave as if it were a space of functions on u of f. Um, and in order to, for this to behave like functions on the open set U of F, you remember last lecture, there were three properties it had. It had to have a restriction property and a pre-sheaf property and a sheaf property. So we're going to recall these properties and just check that these things do have the properties. So first of all, let's just check restriction. So restriction just means if we've got a map, say U of F1, F2, which is contained in U of F1, then we should have a restriction map from R of F1, um, F2 to the minus one. So the restriction map goes in the opposite direction. Um, restriction map from R of F1 to the minus one to R of F1, F2 to the minus one. So um, this just corresponds to restricting a function on this open set to this smaller open set. So since there's an obvious map from this localization to that localization, we do indeed have restriction maps. And you can check that they satisfy some obvious conditions for restriction maps, like composition, if you've got the chain of three open sets. Um, the next was the pre-sheaf property which says that if U of F is covered by sets U of F I, so here's U of F, and it might be covered by three sets U of F1, U of F2, U of F3. And suppose G um, um, in the ring of functions on U of F, is zero in the ring of functions on U of F I for all I, then G should be zero. So that's just saying that if a function is zero on all sets of an open cover, then it should be zero. So we better check that, that it satisfies this condition. So here, this is just um, R of F to the minus one. And now we should think about what it means for um, the U of F I to cover U of F. Well, first of all, we can replace R by R F minus one. And doing this, we can assume that F equals one. So we're talking about covering the whole spectrum of the ring by these sets U of F I. And then the sets U of F I cover the spectrum of R. Um, well, this means that no maximal ideal or no prime ideal contains all the Fi. Otherwise, it would be a point of spectrum of R not contained in these sets. So this implies that the ideal generated by the Fi is the whole of R because it's not contained in a maximal ideal. So this implies sum of A i F i equals one, the sum A i. So this is, this is the condition that says these open sets cover the spectrum of the ring. 
Um, now suppose that um, let's let's take g to be an element of R, and suppose that g equals naught on all these rings O of U of F I. Um, well, what this means is that g times f i to the n i equals naught for some n i, because this is the condition for, for g to be naught in the localization r f i minus one. Um, and now um, we know that um, f one to f n generate the unit ideal. And um, we'll also f1 to the n1 up to f uh, n to the n, uh, that's a rather bad notation, n, n, also generates the unit ideal of r because we can just take sum of a i f i equals 1 and raise this to some high power and we'll discover that um, 1 can also be written in terms of powers of the f i. So sum of b i f i to the n i equals 1 for some B i. Um, well, now let's just multiply this by g. So we find g is equal to sum of b i f i to the n i g. Well, this bit is just naught um, by assumption up there. So g equals zero. So in other words, um, our definition of the ring of functions on an open set does behave reasonably um, in that if a function is zero on all open sets of a cover, then it's zero. Um, next, we have the sheaf condition, which is a bit trickier. So this says that suppose the u of the f i cover u of f. So here we might have u of f1 u of f2, u of f3, and u of f might be the union of these. So suppose we're given ri over fi to the ni on the regular, as a regular function O of fi. And suppose these are the same on the intersection u of fi intersection u of fj. In other words, um, in, in other words, ri over fi to the ni is equal to rj over fj to the nj on this set. Then we can find some r over f in u of f um, equal to ri over fi to the ni on u of f i. So what this is saying is we, if we're given functions on each of these open sets of a cover and they're equal on the intersections of these open sets, then we can glue them together and get a function on the big set. And we'd better check that our definition of functions on open sets satisfies this condition. Um, well, as we're going to prove this in several steps. So step one, it's the most important one, is to cheat. We're going to assume um, R is an integral domain for simplicity. Um, the result is still true, even if we don't assume this, but it's a little bit trickier. In fact, it's so tricky that I always get it muddled up whenever I try and do it for R, not an integral domain. So we're going, only going to do a simple special case. So step two, as before, we can assume that f equals one um, by replacing r by the localization r f to the minus one. So in other words, we're assuming that the u f i's cover the spectrum of r. Again, as before, um, we have sum of um, a i f i equals one for some um, a i as the u f i cover the spectrum of the ring r. Um, 
Um, step four, we can assume that um, all the uh, ni equals one, just replace fi by fi to the ni. Um, so we're given elements um, um, ri over fi, and the, the exponent up here we're just taking to be one. And the problem, um, the goal, is to find some element r in r with um, f i r is equal to r i. So in other words, we're just saying r is equal to r i over f i on, on the localization. Um, and we know that some of the a i f i equals one. So if if we had an r with this property, um, what we're going to do now is is uh, just sort of do figure out what r. Suppose we have found such an r. Let's try and figure out what it is. Well, we know that some of a i f i is one. So some of a i f i r would have to be equal to r. And if f i r i is equal to r i. This would have to be equal to sum of a i r i. So um, this suggests, so we define r to be sum of a i r i, because it has to be that if, if it has this property. Now we have to check that f i r equals r i. So this calculation doesn't doesn't prove this yet. I mean, we assumed f i r equals r i in order to deduce that r was equal to that. But the implication the other way is is something a little bit trickier that we still need to prove. Um, so we can prove it as follows. So we've got to show f i r equals r i. So we calculate f i r is equal to sum of a j r j times f i, um, and um, this is because um, just write this in here. Here we're assuming the fact. Here, here we're using the fact that r is equal to sum of r j um, a j by definition of r, and this is equal to sum of um, a j f j r i, which looks like a misprint, but we'll come to that later. And this is equal to um, r i, and this is because we're using the fact that sum of a j f j is equal to one. And you remember this followed because our open sets covered the spectrum of r. Now we come to this middle inequality um, so what's going on here? Well, here we seem to be saying that RJFI is equal to um, RIFJ, which looks like a misprint. Well, this is true because um, RI over FI is equal to RJ over FJ on O of Fi intersection O of Fj. Um, and here we're also using the fact that R is an integral domain. If R is not an integral domain, then the condition that the, these two are equal on this intersection is a little bit more complicated than this because you've got to put um, factors of Fi and Fj on both sides and things get, get into a real mess. So anyway, we've proved that um, R has restriction Ri over Fi on O uh, in, in the ring O of uh, U of Fi, which shows that the um, our, our definition really does behave as if it is um, functions on open sets of the ring. So open sets of the spectrum. What we have 
essentially done is construct something called the affine scheme of the ring. So the affine scheme just means you take the, 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 the space spectrum of R and each open set of the form um, O of U of Fi, you assign the ring um, R of Fi to the minus one, and then you check these behave as if they were um, functions on the open set U of Fi by, by doing the check we've done above. So the spectrum of the ring R is, is used very heavily in algebraic geometry. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is to, for the rest of this lecture, is give you a sort of dictionary relating the ring R to the affine scheme um, spec of R together with, with the, the rings I associated before. So, so this side is going to be algebra and this side is going to be geometry. And what we're going to do is, is have a sort of way of converting between algebraic facts and um, geometric facts. So first of all, a ring is going to correspond to this topological space spectrum of R together with this collection of, of rings on open sets. And what does a, a, a prime ideal correspond to? Well, a prime ideal, that's easy. It just corresponds to a point because we define the points of spectrum of R to be prime ideals. So that's not a big deal. Maximal ideals, well, we've done that. They correspond to closed points because we've got this rather weird topology on the spectrum where points need not be closed. What about an, a, a, an element of R? Well, this corresponds to a sort of function. You remember um, um, whether or not it was a function was a little bit hazy because the, the space it took values in sort of varied. So for each point P, um, we have to take values in the local ring RP and this, this local ring can vary. So it's a rather funny sort of function. Um, if the ring has no null potence, then instead of this local ring, as we saw, we can take values in the field. A function can also correspond to a sort of hypersurface of zeros, which is the set of P such that F is not in P. However, this is not one-to-one -one because if you multiply the function by some say scalar in a field, you'll get the same hypersurface. So um, that's not an exact correspondence. What about an ideal of the ring? Well, ideals correspond to closed sets, as we saw earlier, because if we've got an ideal, um, we, we, we can just take a closed set sort of corresponding informally to the points where all elements of the ideal vanish. And again, this is not one-to-one -one correspondence because different ideals can actually give rise to the same closed set. What about a local ring RP where we localize it at a prime? Well this corresponds to local rings of the spectrum of R which is informally functions defined near point P. So um, what we do is we take a small neighborhood of P and look at the functions defined on that neighborhood and then kind of take a direct limit as that neighborhood um, gets smaller and smaller. Um, what about a localization R F to the minus one? Well this corresponds to a special open set of the form um, u of f, um, so that would just be u of f. So these form a basis of the topology. So not all open sets are necessarily of this form. And I guess um, uh, different elements f can give the same localization. So again, this isn't quite a one-to-one -one correspondence, but um, 
we can think of localizations as something to do with open sets. More generally, we can have a localization R of S to the minus one for some set S. And this sort of vaguely corresponds to an intersection of open sets. So we might have an infinite intersection of open sets. And this is something to do with a more general localization of R. Or you can take an idempotent A with A squared equals A. And these correspond to closed and open sets. So um, this corresponds to the, the, the set where informally where A is equal to zero. So if A squared equals one, you can check that the prime ideals containing A form a set that is both open and closed in the spectrum of R. So th th this kind of corresponds to they're sometimes called clopen sets. Um, so um, uh, finally, one thing that I'm not going to say so much about because we haven't quite covered it yet is that modules um, over the ring will turn out to correspond to certain sheaves over the spectrum. But since we haven't really discussed sheaves, um, I'm going to just leave that to an algebraic geometry course. So let's have an example and see what this looks like for two rings. As usual, I take the two basic rings, spectrum of C of X and the spectrum of Z, and show that these are, uh, as usual, rather closely analogous. So the spectrum of C of X looks a bit like the complex plane. So it's got points naught in C corresponding to the ideal X and the point three corresponding to the ideal X minus three and so on. And it's got a generic point corresponding to the ideal zero. And we could look at an open set. We might look at the open set um, corresponding to say the function F, let's take X to be X minus one, X minus four and look at u of f. Well, u of f will just be the open set where we take the complement of the points. Um, let me, oops, sorry, that should be the point one. Let me change that to x minus one. We take the complement of the points one and four in the complex numbers. So uh, u of f is this blue set here. And then the, the ring O of U of F will just be C of X, where we localize at X minus one to the minus one and X minus four. So we allow, you can think of this as being functions where we allow poles at one and four. For instance, a typical element might be X squared over X minus one squared X minus four, and this will be in the ring of regular functions on the set U of F. So you see it's regular except at one and four. So U of F doesn't have the points one and four in it, so that's okay. We can, we can think of it as having a pole of order two at this point and a pole of order one at that point, if we like. And then we can do something very similar for spectrum of Z. So we might, for example, take various points on spectrum of Z corresponding to prime ideals as usual. And we might take F to be, say, the function um, um, 14. And then U of F will be the spectrum of Z with the numbers 2 and 7 omitted. And um, what will O of U of F be? Well, it would be Z where we invert two and we invert seven. So you should think of uh, this operation here as corresponding to this operation here. And a typical element of this ring might be, say, um, um, nine over 28. So this will be in the ring O of U of F, which we can think of as being three squared over, say, two squared times seven. And you can think of this rational number as being a sort of function 
which is defined on spec of z except at the point 2 and the point 7. And you see it's not defined at 2 because it's got a pole of order 2 at the prime 2 in the same way that this has a pole of order 2 at the prime x minus 1. And it's got a pole of order 1 at the prime 7. Um, so, so this is the, a very geometric way of thinking of rings. You, th you think of elements of rings as being functions on the spectrum of Z, and you think of elements of certain localizations of the ring as being functions on open sets of the spectrum of the ring. Okay, um, next lecture, we will be reviewing tensor products in preparation for discussing the relation between tensor products and localization.